Consulting, Dr. Ben Gigi. Why don't you come forward, please, and uh, lead us into God's Word. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, and shalom, and boker tov to you. Good morning. The Torah portion today includes, a, again, a very interesting way and measure of communication between, a two-way communication between a person, which is the, normally the high priest, and the Lord. And it, well, it's not here today, that was the ark. And we did it, I think, um, a few months ago in a, one Torah portion, they mentioned again the, this is the measure, something that uh, was used by the prof, by the by prophets too, but also mainly by the high priest to communicate with the Lord in moments of grave importance to the nation. And we'll see it here, and I'll talk to about it again. I don't know if everybody heard it last time, but it's good to know there was that means of communication available, and it's not just like by vision or not only by a prayer, but it was a direct two-way communication. But let's start with the Torah portion of the today, and that's Parashat Pinchas, the Torah portion of Pinchas. And a part, large part of this Torah portion includes many names and so on, names, and uh, we had to, you know, kind of uh, skip those because you will not remember them and they are very detailed, this name. But we'll... Focus on the important parts. Vayomer Adonai, and God said, well, look at the first verse there in uh, verse 10. This is where the Torah portion starts. And what you can actually see there is really taken directly from the Mark Bilt's Bible. These are the characters we're using, and this is the col these are the colors, and that's the size. It's pretty big, so everybody can really enjoy it. So you see a line in Hebrew on the top, which is very new font, which is beautiful, Hebrew, beautiful Hebrew font. And then the English clear cut, you can see in the blue, what's the word in Hebrew in case somebody wants to say it out loud. Um, and it's separated by syllables. And then the line below is the translation. Now that area, since this is taken from the Old Testament, we're not done yet with the Old Testament, but we're very close. And I'll talk a little bit about that if the time allows, about what is so unique in that Bible and how it is life-transforming Bible. And why is the expectation that, my expectation definitely, Pastor Mark is doing a tremendous work here. But if the time allows, I'll expand a little bit about that. You'll see what's unique there and how I believe it's going to be the Bible in the future. The Bible in the future in English. Uh, but let's take some time on that. So I only did the um, phonetic on, on the first verse. You can see what it looks like. And that the same thing looks the New Testament. The same way, Hebrew, phonetic, and then the English translation. The English translation in the Mark Wills Bible will be paved all the way through with green words. Greens are the Mark Wills corrections. And corrections... But we'll talk about it. I don't want to take more time from the Torah portion. We'll go back to there. So in verse 11, God says, Pinchas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned my anger away from the people of Israel while he, is, he was zealous for my sake among them that I consumed not the people of Israel in my jealousy. One of God's name, if you know, is Elkanah. And they, that word means a jealous God. God is jealous. He's experiencing a very human feeling, an emotion. He could be jealous. And it's the, the word, you know, relates to the zeal that God has to his, to his people, to his chosen, and to his, those who came and joined under the wing of Shekinah, those who joined the faith and they join and they believe in God in him. And he's very zealous to them, and he is very jealous to, um, to the faith that people put in him and will not turn to other gods. 
and the danger of other gods with all it's it's very it's omnipresent omnipresent throughout the bible this is the purpose of most of the works of the of the prophets people easily flip away they leave the track and they go to idol to to start idoling to worship idols and why would they do that you think about that what what's the issue why can they stay with the lord almighty and then they have to go and flip their faith to other gods. That's what happened here. He's talking about. Um, so his anger was over the people of Israel, not all of them, but some, you know. And um, that's what, what Pinchas is about. What did he do? Let's take a look. <clears throat> Verse 12 says, Therefore, say, behold, I give to him my covenant of peace. How does this covenant been, has been reached? How did he gain this covenant of peace? And so that was, um, and it shall have it, and he shall have it, right? And he seed after him the covenant of the everlasting priesthood because he was zealous for his God and made the atonement for the second sign for the people of Israel. Okay, so what he did, he really slay, he did slay someone, right? And the name of the, the Israelite, this was one man from Israel, right? Um, Israel that was slain was, yeah, was with a Midianite woman, was Zimri. His name is Zimri, the son of Salu, a, a prince of, yeah, a prince of father's house among the uh, Shimonites. Shimonites is simply the, People, the tribe of Shimon, right? Simon. Um, so, very important in ranking, and um, he, he had to slay her. And the name of the Midianite woman, Midian is the name of an ancient nation of, that we learn in the Bible. And the name of the Midianite woman that was slain with Cosby was Cosby, the daughter of Tzur, Strangely enough, the name Tzur is one of the names of God too. Tzur, the rock, you know, the, the rock of ages and so on. And this is also her name, which is not a Jewish, she's a Midianite woman. And uh, the father was, he was the chief over the people of the father's house of Midian. Now let's stop here for a second. So now it this Midian is a very serious enemy that God really need to uh, slay um, them for what they've done. What have they done, really, these Midianites? I mean, if you remember when Moses struck the men, the Egyptian foreman there that was torturing his brothers in Egypt, he had to escape. You remember? He had to escape from where he was and went to the area of Midian. We know it later on, but he left at the age of maybe, I don't know, 20 some, 30 maybe, or less, came back to our uh, story of the Bible at the a very old age, 99 or so, right? Very close to the time that he went to Pharaoh. Where has he been all these years? There's a big mystery of what happened to Moses, but we know that he married a Midianite woman, right? She was the daughter of the high priest of Midian. So he married her. She was not a Jew, and there is not an issue there at the time of the Bible, of marrying outside the faith. Most of our mothers, you know, the matriarchs of the Jewish uh, hierarchy, I mean, they're not Jewish. You know, they once they married the fathers, they became, they were grafted in and they became, at that time, the father was the one who set the, um, the faith of the family. Today it's different. Today is the mother. At that time was the father. So he could marry women from the other nations, and that was perfectly okay with the faith. And there was not a problem. And it's a state, state of mind, of course, or a law at the time, a ruling or whatever. Today, is what's setting it is the mother, not the father. But at that time, he married the Midianite woman, Tzipora, right? That's her name. And uh, everything was okay. But the Midianites are not Jews. They're idol worshippers. They did worship the idols. 
Now, what is that? What is this attraction and why we have it throughout the entire Old Testament that people flipping away from the ways of God and they are joining and start following false prophet, uh, false God, no, not false prophet. False prophet is our second session today. It's a very fascinating hour that we're going to do the next hour. We're talking about the the true and the history of the Antichrist. But here we're talking about false gods. Well, how did they do it? What, what is the attraction to false god? What did they do? Well, think, think of Hollywood or some stuff that's coming from Los Angeles today. So there are big feasts, a lot of big feasts, ceremonial stuff with lights and, and other kind of things. And then the major way to turn away men from faith, well, faith was by harlots. And who are, those are, well, there is a difference between those prostitutes at the time and the harlots. The prostitutes are simple, doing that for money, right? The harlots were selling their body to people giving in order to sway, in order to convert them to idols. And that was done so pervasively all over, including at the gates of the temple in Jerusalem. If you remember, Yeshua, Jesus was very, very, very mad on these practices. They did also trading there, changing money, all kind of stuff, and also had harlots there at the temple. Now, the, strangely enough, the word harlot and prostitute is very different in English, right? Two different words. Guess what they are in Hebrew? The word holy in Hebrew, as sometimes we say it here, I heard Matthew, you know the word kadosh, right? Kadosh is holy, right? And the word for a har harlot is kedesh, well, a woman. If they said, if you were to say the word holy in feminine, you would say kdosha, and the harlot is kdesha. Almost the same, K, D, and S, H, right? The same root, the same word, so there is a connection between holiness and, and harlotry, right? And the harlot. And this is because the, the, it really denotes the notion, the principle of what they did. They swayed away men by giving them those services, and they turned them away from God. One of the big teachings of Pastor Mark is about the king, King Solomon, and the thousand wives that he had. Of course, the, none of them were Jews. And uh, one was Bathsheba, I think he was Jewish. But uh, all the rest were non-Jewish, and he did have to let them, of course, sacrifice to their own God. They were not required or requested to convert to Judaism. And apparently he participated, but this is part of what Pastor Mark is teaching, his big teaching, you know. Uh, he's going to talk about it next week, God is willing, on the second part. He's doing a seven-session seven series about King Solomon, and he's going to relate to that subject as well. But so this was the way that was really lurking and, and almost ambushing the families and people, and that was really the reason of why the prophets, prophets were needed. They, in every generation, every prophet, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, all of them, and the, the, the 12 prophets, right, Hosea and others, all of them were basically complaining about leaving God and switching to those idols and following the idols. This is what happened here, and that is what makes God very jealous and very zealous at the same time to eradicate the notion of flipping to other gods. Now, thinking about what is other gods, are they really a threat to believers? Are you going to be threatened if you see somebody... I don't know, I don't want to say any particular religion, but somebody that had a statue, and you can imagine in your own imagination is some kind of a, a god, a lower case, you know, some kind of an idol, and people worshiping this idol. <laughs> Are you going to feel threatened by that? You're not, right? But the problem with the monotheistic religion of faith is that you don't see your god. Unlike Judaism, that brought to the world the notion of the God that is invisible, the God that is in high heaven, we cannot see him, 
we cannot touch him, we cannot smell him. In other religions, they, they did put all kind of spices on those idols, and people came, hmm, that God smells so good, you know. And other kind of practices that made them very vivid and very human-like, in, if possible, in some. In some others, they're not human-like. They look like scary creatures, you know. In some other places, they're just animals. Like in Egypt, you saw the cats and other. And um, later on, they developed the God. This is the big threat. By the way, the New Testament that you're following is, I'm trying to teach it, it's basically an SOS. The gospel is an SOS call. Or as I say, S-Y-S, save your souls. What are the threat at the time? You know, they're not in the land, right? They have been already taken, the Jews were taken to exile, and there were no Christians at the time. You just need to understand that. They're either Jews or pagans, idol worshippers. So they are now in very affluent area, in Aphysia, in Corinthia, in Galicia, in Thessalonia, Saloniki. It's a place in Greek, in Greece. Um, so what was the threat? As long as they had their Poseidon and Aphrodite and all those, okay, they are cutesy mootsy gods, you know, and they were pretty much visible, and the Jews did not feel very threatened, you know. They kept on their customs and following God in their synagogues. And you read that in the New Testament throughout their time. They were in synagogues, right? It says there. But... A new fed, fed came from the east, and that was Ishtar. Now, the early Ishtar Ashtoreth did have all kind of iconic figurine and, and pictures and stuff. But later on, they spoke about almost like a spiritual goddess, right? And she was the goddess of fertility. And she had also the story of immaculate conception, so this is how the egg came to power to be a symbol of fertility. came from Ishtar, and that's Ashtoreth in Hebrew or in ancient. That affected the people there, even the Jews, and the others, they fed up with their regular, ordinary, iconic figurines, you know, of uh, Cupid and Poseidon and all those, and they're now switching to the new fed, the new religion that came from the east and starts sweeping <clears throat> all these territories where Jews were in the islands there, in the Aegaic, around the Aegaic Sea, you know? That was a big danger because they start switching to that faith and that was not monotheistic, but in a way, yes, there were not, ex there were not multiple goddesses there. There was the Ishtar. And that new fad came from the east, from Babylonia, and swept to Europe. It was a new, very exciting, very lucrative way of changing and transforming the faith of people. That was the time that the New Testament, the gospel, came out and tried to save the brothers, fellow Jews, for flipping into that kind of faith. And, the, and that's why the New Testament, is ba most of the gospel is basically... S-Y-S, save your soul. Leave it alone. I mean, you don't go to that route. It's a very dangerous route. Remember it from the Old Testament. God is very zealous on his, for his people and for the, the believers. And don't get out of that. And you need to flip and come back. Come back with a promise. I mean, they've been taken away to exile as a result of a war, right? Re re revolting and so on. There was no way to co go back in the normal way. So they were telling them, no, there is hope. Even though you are abroad, even though you are away from your land, the homeland of Israel, there is hope. And they called this hope in the name of Messiah. They said, the hope is there. You know, you'll bring back everyone, you know. And that was the belief that Messiah, this is an older belief, even before Jesus Yeshua, that Messiah, what he will do? What will Messiah do? Revive the dead, right? Bring back the dead, and gather back the all the um, um, how do you say the people that, of Israel that spread out among the nations. So he will bring them back to the land. God is promising it all over, right? Mezare Israeli the one who scattered Israel all over the land, 
will gather him, it back, or him, if you want to see it as a living entity. Give, gather Israel back to its land. All right, so this is explaining some of the jealousy that God has. He knows the people's heart, how easily they lap and they flip away from faith and following other gods, you know. So it takes a very severe action here, and and um, and Pinchas, the one, the man that after him is the Torah portion, he is doing the job. You know, he goes and he slays the Israelite men, Zimri, and he slays also the woman, uh, the Midianite woman, Cosby Batsur. That's her name, Cosby Batsur. And but this is not enough. After this is happening, remember Moses is married. A Midianite woman, right? Yet, verse 16, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tzaror et Midianim v'hikita otam. Harass the Midianite and strike them. Listen to this. So, no more good relationship there between Moses and the Midianite. He needs to harass them. And Horace is not just like running after them and calling names. It's much more serious than that. And strike them. Killing. Why? For they harassed you with their will, right? With their trickery ways. With which they have... What did they do? Ah, for the... You know, there was a, there was a god there, ancient god that they had called the Peor. Baal Peor. You know, the, the Baal, the name Baal in, in English, B-A-A-L, B-A-A-L, has different kind of names. Depends what comes after that. It was kind of a prototype or master, kind of a master, uh, you know, in a matrix god, ancient god, lowercase. And there was Baal Peor and, and other kind. Baal Zvuv, you know, the Baal Zvuv and other kind of Baals. Depends where you are, but it's still part of the Baal. The B A L, and um, okay. So and then for that, for the Baal Peor, it says only the Peor, but it's actually the matter of Peor. But it's the matter of Baal Peor, and the matter of Cosby, uh, the daughter of the president of Midian, their sister, that was stricken, and that day, and that day, and there was another thing there. There was the Magefa, which is the plague. So we didn't hear about the plague until now. So not only striking them, not only hitting them, there is also a plague. If you go next verse, um, we ended it there. And then we go to uh, chapter 26. And we're saying, and it, and it came to pass after the plague that the Lord spoke to Moses and to Elazar, the son of Aaron, Aaron, the priest, saying, and here comes something, comes something that is very interesting. He says to them, take a census of the congregations of the people of Israel from 20 years old and upward throughout their father's house, all who are able to go to the war in Israel. Now, you find it a little strange. They are 20 years old and then they go to the war? What happens in every army? I mean, you try to use the young people, you know, when they are really capable of fighting, uh, to use them for the war machine or to the war purposes. But they are waiting until the age of 20 to gather them to, the, to be able to serve. What happens in America? You go, you have to wait 20. You can do alcohol at 21, but you go to the army, to the military at 20, at, at 18, right? Likewise in Israel, likewise in every other civilized nation. In some places, they take them when they are 15, you know. But this is like terror groups. You know, Hamas, for instance, are drafting them when they are even 14 or 15, and they put them in there. They don't even know what they're doing. They just put a gun in their hands, or, and they let them you know, become young terrorists. But in civilized nations, the age is normally 18, right? In some places, in special sequences, it will be 17, but it's 18. Now, why here is 20? Anybody has an idea? Why, why is it 20? What's the purpose of the 20 here? No? Okay. Um, you know, if the war, what happens in war, people get killed. And if they killed and they are part of families in Israel, as you see later, this is a census. Um, they are part of families. 
but in the, if they're very young, they don't have enough time to raise a family yet. So maybe the idea here, we don't know it for granted, but perhaps is allowing them enough time to get married and have an heir, a child or two, before they can go to war. So if something happens to them, the family does not lose its property and its continuation. So it doesn't, you know, a child dies, this is it, you know. But that gives them enough time, which is really unique, and you, you never hear it any other place, the age of 20. Why wait? You know, 18 years old is very capable of fighting, right? Strong, very strong, very, the muscles are in the best shape. I mean, their body physically is the best in, in, in terms of ability to fight, but yet they're waiting another two years to give them a time to bring them. That was uh, Noga's idea that she kind of learned the Bible in Israel and uh, suggested it, and they checked it, and it's very, very um, much fits the purpose of having a child in air before you go to war. Page 52, I mean, verse 52, I skipped some verses here. Um, and God spoke to Moses to say, to this you shall divide the land in, an, in, in, in okay, in the, to numbers and names. Now, what does it mean? The, the one that, to the large, you know, the tribes are not the same in numbers. There are 12 tribes of Israel, right? They have different numbers. Uh, ten, yeah, they have different numbers of people in the tribe. So he does something very logical. He said, the one that has a large number of people give a larger piece of land. Now, this is a division of the land of Israel that was promised by God to the people of Israel upon entering the land, right? And there are tribes all over, some in the north, some in the center, and some in the south. And in the tribe, which tribe really received Jerusalem? What tribe was that? What? Yeah, Judah and? Yep, they were right there. They were in the, in the Jerusalem area. Now, that tribe, Judah, in Hebrew, Yehuda, right? Is the, right? Yehuda and Benjamin, right? These are the two tribes, really, or mainly Judah, is the only one that survived today. Um, the, le- the rest of them, the, the two, right? But the name Judah is Yehuda in Hebrew. And the man, and the word for Jew, like from Judah, Jew, Jewish, is Yehudi. The word Yehudi, meaning really the people of Israel today are mostly, oh, almost all, are descendants of the tribe of Judah. The rest of the ten tribes have been taken away to exile and disappeared. Nobody found them. There were many attempts to go and try to track them down, the other tribes, but they couldn't find them. One assumption, and I, I did see it on, one time on, on Nightline years ago with Ted Koppel on ABC, um, and then they did something on CNN on that one, and that was the search they did. Well, you're not going to be believing what they found. They, where did they go? I mean, we know the direction they were taking them like way north, right? Northeast, those t- 10 tribes. And they found out, assumption, not 100%, but they, and there were several small signs that led them to think that this is really where they are. And this is where today is Afghanistan and some areas of India. So basically, the Pashtun, you know, basically the Bin Laden group was apparently part of the Ten Tribe, or people like them, you know, the Taliban. Their features are not Arabic, and, not, and they don't look like people from that region. They don't look like people in India or in Pakistan. They're very different, and this is the same region. Um, they look more or, less, more or less like Jews, you know, like Israelites. And um, two... The names of those places there are pretty surprising. They have Kabul as the capital of Afghanistan. Kabul is, in Hebrew, the sediment in the bottom of the oceans or rivers or lakes. And then look at the place that Bin Laden was hiding. Do you remember the place where he was hiding? Tora, Bora, remember? Well, some of them are too, you, too young. Some other people nodding. Tora, Bora, this is where he was hiding. Why Tora? How did he get Torah there? Another sign that they find out to be surprising and very strange is their 
had a custom there that you never see among Muslims. They are Muslims today. They will light candles on Friday nights. No Muslim will light candles on Friday nights. It's not. It's a Jewish custom. And they see them there, and they ask some women. I saw it on TV. There was a program. I said, why do you do that? They said, I don't know. My grandmother was doing that. And she learned it from her grandmother. How did it get to this custom? And some more, even the name Pashtun, you know? You know what it means in Hebrew? It's coming from the root raiders. So when they came there, they viewed them as somebody who raided the land. This is an assumption. Don't take it for granted. It's an assumption. There is no complete scientific evidence that this is the case. But that's what one of the assumptions were, that the 10 tribes are, they ended up in that area. Of course, they're not Jews anymore, but strange customs still continue. Names appearing there, and I don't know even all of them. I didn't get to. But there is a whole uh, document of Professor Whale. She's an Israeli professor. It's in my book. Uh, it's not in the book. I don't know if it's in the book, but it's in the program. Um, never mind. It, it, we have it written. Um, it's called... Um, I do have it. It's uh, in uh, The Supernatural Life of Hebrew. You can find it there. But that's a whole story there of the whole research. It's another research that was done after that. People went and tried to find out the traces. I mean, they're kind of fantasy there too. You know, they had to go to that area. They're speaking about a river that works for six days a week and seizes on Shabbat. And, you know, the name of that river is called Sambat Yon. The name Sambat, Samba, in many languages is the name for Saturday, Samba, right? Sambat in Hungarian, in Romanian, in many languages, that's the name for Saturday. So this river seizes on Saturday, but all week long, it's working. It's not passable. You can't pass that. So on the way to discover the tribes, they had to go and cross that river or the Sambation. It's a mysterious, mystical, mythical, whatever river. But let's jump to back to the Bible. So, so he, he, he kind of spread. He shares or divides the the nation. I mean the yeah the the inheritance of Israel. And then it says in in verse fifty five. Uh, however, the land should be divided by lot. So not favoring anyone and say, okay, this part of land is yours. It's more fruitful. It's, more, it's more, more the sea, whatever. It's going to be by lot, but according to the size of the tribe. So 56 says the same thing. According to the lot, its possession shall be divided between many and few. Now, we skipped some area, some uh, verses there. There are many verses there that has names of Israelites in the desert that have not received, um, it, it, yeah, it, that have never managed to, you know, arrive back to the land. They were punished, really, to, to finish the generation, to consume the life of that generation in the desert, and only people that were not part of those already entered the land. And except for two, the sons of the priest, Nadav and Avihu, and they did not receive uh, the inheritance in Israel, God remembers because of the strange fire. And we discussed it a long time ago, the strange fire that came down, that they lit in sacrifice instead of having God sending down his fire, they were punished and they are not going to get an inheritance in Israel. So they will have no land. No lands are nomads, you know, I mean, wh how did it go? They have to go between. There was one tribe that did not receive a, a parcel of land. You know, you remember the tribe? Who was that tribe? Who? The Levi, right? The Levi, and the name Levi in Hebrew means to accompany. It is true twice. It was true once when the child the child was born, right? One of the tribes, and she called him. His mother called him Levi, and she meant to say, "So my husband will accompany me now." because he did not like her so much, like he liked, liked Rachel. So he said, I'll call him Levi. Perhaps now my husband, my husband will accompany me. And that's Levi number one. And Levi number two, that tribe did not receive a parcel, a land. And, this is be and then it really accompanied Israel anywhere they were. So this is Levi twice, to accompany twice. Accompany the, the father 
and accompany the people of Israel where they are. They didn't have a, they didn't have a parcel of land. But they were in the temple. They were in the service of the temple and so on. Okay. Um, so, but among these were was this were, was not a man of them whose Moses and Aaron the priests counted. And when they counted the people of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai, and then what happened to the rest? For the Lord has said to them, they shall surely die in the wilderness. And there was not left a man of them, save Caleb, Caleb, ben Yefune, the son of Yefune, and Yeshua, Yeshua bin Nun. Now, by the way, the name Yeshua means God will save. Joshua, Ye is God. Shua means to save. And that's the same name as Jesus, Yeshua, right? And it's the same name as Isaiah, also Yeshaya. And the same name is Hosea. All of them has the same name. God will save. Hosea, same. And probably more, but this is what we think about. So let's go to the next um, area. And look what happens here. This is a very interesting event that happens. The, daughter of, the daughters of Tzlovchad, Ben Hefer, Ben, Gil, ben Gilad, Ben Machir, Ben Menashe, to the families of, Men, you know, the son, to the family of Menasseh, sons of Yosef, and, he, and here are the names of his daughter. These are the daughters, okay? Machla, Noah. Now, Noah is not a man's name in Hebrew. Noah is a woman's name. Noah, the one that you think of Noah as a guy, is Noah. Noah, that's the name in Hebrew. But Noah is a woman's name. So that's the daughter, Noah, Chogla, Milka, and Tirza. You know what is Tirza? What is his name led to today? Not only today, for many times in the, in the Christian or in the European and the Hindu-European names, is this is the name of Teresa. Tirza is Teresa. That's where it came from. Mother Teresa, right? Tirza, the Hebrew name of Tirza. So um, this is the origin of that name. And they stood before Moses and Eleazar, the priest, and before the president or the, what do you call, the princess of all the congregation by the door of the tent of meeting, Ohel Moed, saying, our father died in the desert and he was not among the, I'm doing an impromptu concern, in the company of those who gathered themselves together against the Lord, you know, there was a rebellion, right? Right? A revolt there. So he was not, they are saying, he was not among those, my, our father of Korach, you know, Korach who revolted, right? But he died, but died in his own sin and had no sons. Okay? He had a different sin that is not punishable. He, he was punished by death, but he still deserves inheritance. Now, you understand, there are, the, the, there are tribes, but in the tribes were heads of families there. And the families included many people. You know, it could be 10,000 all in all and more. So when they get inheritance, it was really very particular. You and you getting this land, this parcel, this parcel. Look at the picture from a Google map, you know, once above. You look at that from satellite, and you see how parcels are divided. Very interesting, you know. All over. These are parcels that are belonging to people. First, they claim them at the time, but later on, when they purchase, they are really divided, and counties know that, and that's how they pay taxes and so on. Very organized uh, uh, distribution of land to people. So, the daughters are coming, and they're saying he died in his sin, but he deserved a part of the land, and he did not have sons. But these are daughters. You know what happens up till today in, in the not undeveloped world about the daughters, what's their importance? Very low, you know. In America, how many years women are voting, you know? You can count them, you know, very few years all in all, right? Women were not in a position to even claim anything. They could not even vote in the U.S., you know. But... Uh, and, of course, they are deprived of many rights all over. But look what happens here. So they say, well, the, our father died, but we claim a piece of parcel of land. Why? Okay. 
and then why should the name of our father be taken away from among his family because he had no sons give to us therefore a possession among the brothers of our father well a strange demand first first time a very interesting demand Moses does not know what to do but guess what as pastor Mark says <laughs> <laughs> and Moses brought their case before the Lord. He couldn't, he couldn't handle it. Too complex. I mean, a question like that, I mean, look, the judge is in charge of all the judges and all the others. But this is a very, very, very particular, very difficult subject. He brings it up to God himself. And God says, the daughter of Tzlofchad speak right. Wow, what a judgment. You shall surely give them possession of inheritance among their father's brothers, and you shall cause the inheritance of their father to pass to them. So they have a full right over the land, being his daughters. But for here came a complete detailed law. And God says, and you shall speak to the people of Israel. He's extending the law and says, if a man dies and has no son, then you shall cause his inheritance to pass to his daughter's daughter, right? Or in that case, daughters. But he goes further and says, and if he has no daughter, then you shall give his inheritance to his brothers. So brothers are lesser than the daughter. In the okay, and then in the next, in the next verse. And if he doesn't have brothers and you gave his inheritance to the, to the brother, brothers of his father. But look at it. All these are all males secondary to the daughters. All of these are males. You notice that, right? And if, he, and if the, his father has no brothers, then you should give his inheritance to his kinsmen, right? Who is next to him of his family, right? And but this is still speaking in, in this is still in male jargon, in male terminology, should be possessed. And it shall be to the people of Israel uh, a statute of judgment as the Lord commanded Moses. This is a statute, this is a law. This is a the law of what to do. Okay, and then God says to Moses, and uh, he says to him, a uh, Go up to the Mount of Avarim, you know, Mount of, not Avarim, it's Avarim in Hebrew, means passes, paths, you know, and see the land that which I, given, I have given to the people of Israel. He shows him that and he says, you saw it and you should be gathered to your people, meaning you will die. Um, just like your brother Aaron has been gathered to his people and he died. And why is that? Why? You are bringing me all the desert and all that and doing that and being such a close. And he's the father of the prophets and he still doesn't let him go uh, to get the inheritance that is promised to the people of Israel. Because for you rebelled against my commandments in the desert of Tzin in the strife of the congregation to what? Yeah, sanctify me at the water before their eyes. That is the water of Mary. It says in English, Meriba. In Hebrew, it's Meriva, quarrel. In Kadesh, in, that's Kadesh Barnea, right? The place in Kadesh Barnea, in the wilderness of Tzin. And Moses spoke to the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits, Wow, what an expression. God of the spirits? Is that something that you ever heard in the Bible? There are many words. God of love, God of mercy, God of, God of the spirits. Hmm. Okay, God of the spirits of all flesh. Set a man over the congregation. Well, he said, well, if I'm not going to be there, we need a new leader to lead the people of Israel, right? So, but he's talking to him as a God of the spirits. So that man um, who may go out before them and who may, may go in 
before them and who may lead them out and who may bring them in. Look at that. All kind of option, you know, but it's not all. That the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. Okay, so the mover and shaker, basically, the one who takes them, who brings them, one does everything. And God, said to, and God said to Moses, and he's using this word again, and God said to Moses, take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man whom is spirit. And in Hebrew, in whom? A man in whom is spirit. So what about the other people? Don't they have spirits? What, is, what, what does it mean, the man whom is, in whom is spirit? Very interesting expression here, right? And, um, and lay your hand upon him, and you put him before, set him before Elazar, the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. Basically, exert your power or exert your honor and dignity on that man so you'll be respected by the people. But he still is chosen, and he offered him a name, and he said, this is a man that has spirit. I read inter interpretation of that one. Believe me, there are about 80, and I stopped right there. What is the, the Lord of the Spirit? Some people say, well, he knows how to deal with people. Okay, nice. I mean, this is like an important commentator, Rashi. He knows how to go and deal with everyone. The other one says the spirit of leadership, the spirit of God, the spirit of, you know, whatever you pick is correct here. And this is to say that... It's not enough to, you know, this is what happens in interpretation, and we hear it on TV, except for Pastor Mark that speak the truth, and some, a few others, right? A few others. You will see it in his Bible. Um, he really seeks the truth when he teaches, and believe me, I, I check every word that he's saying in, in this Bible. We worked, well, um, he is very keen not to put his view, not to put his ideas into that he has it has to be checked in the bible and i do my share to check it in the hebrew in light of hebrew but hebrew is not enough in the new testament that people assume that it's written in greek so i check we check it both of us we check it in the greek comparing the words and only sometimes we spend an hour over one verse and we debate it back and forth and we check it scientifically thoroughly and then he says, and then he, he records it, you know? And you saw it in verse one here. I may be talking about it later. So um, you'll see people put assertions and ideas and ideology and theology, none, you know, speaking straight from the words that in the Bible and in the, preci in the precision that is unprecedented in his work, you know? And okay, so. So the men, uh, we saw, ma I saw many, many assumptions of what is this, what is that. It could be, so here's the principle. The principle is you read something in the Bible. You go and you go to the pastor that you trust. Mark Bills, I recommend to everybody, including those who don't know him yet, you know. Invite people to El Shaddai so they can get true teaching of the Bible, you know. But if you see some commentary that you don't really buy, quote, unquote, Hard for you to digest and accept. When you see it elsewhere, feel comfortable. The fact that those commentators died 500 years before you were born makes them no way smarter than you, or have not smarter, but have more emotion or what we call spirit than you do. And in the spirit, you understand and you comprehend and you feel and you analyze and you discern. This is the gift of the spirit that each one of you do have, and don't feel too humbled not to dare understanding by your spirit and not by relying on commentaries of so-called famous names and you know that died 500 years ago. With all due respect to the sages, none of them was automatically smarter in the spirit than you are. The spirit of love and faith in God is equal, and these are people using their understanding to the best of their understanding to interpret what's going on, you know. All right, um, we didn't finish this whole thing, right? 
Uh, we almost did. So just let, let's finish it up. So we go where? Well, and you gave, you gave from your glory to that man so the people of Israel would hear it. And oh, and here it gets to the point that I, I promised to talk about. You have two sheets there. I'll do it in the second session. And before El Azar, okay, and he shall stand before El Azar, the priest, who shall ask counsel for him according to the judgment of the Urim. What is the judgment of the Urim? And where is this word Urim coming from? Hopefully we'll do it. I'll do a little bit of that in the next session. I wanted to do much more, but I think this session ended, right? It's 10 o'clock, 10 04. Okay. So we'll do it in the second session after the break. Come back. We'll continue that. Tudaraba. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, yes. Let's applause. Everyone stand, please, for the blessing. And together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word. By the power of your Holy Spirit, through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua, you alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. As Mark would say, take a break. Just want to say we're kind of devastated. There was a terrible tragedy in Israel happened just like a few minutes ago. Again, with Hezbollah, this terror group from Lebanon supported by Iran, killed 10 people, among them children, just playing football in the football. So it's terrible fate that we're going through in, in this land. <coughs> Very devastating. I'll try to separate this and what happened here because <clears throat> we have a subject to cover. But if you can do that in your heart and pray to the, for Israel and for its survival and its prevailing over this vicious, terrible enemies of our people. The subject I want to cover, and, and I know I did not cover the Urim, the Tumim, we spoke in the previous session. Um, I'll try to get there. But I want to cover uh, the subject of the antichrists. And I'm saying it in plural, antichrists. So there are more than one, apparently. Actually, there are many, ample number of people that claim to be Messiah throughout the generations. Surprisingly, some of them are mentioned even in the New Testament, as early as the time, and even, you know, at the time of the Hashmonaim, you know, the Maccabees. Um, they start appearing there when Rome was very strong and Israel was in danger. Some of those false messiahs appeared. Now, there's the big danger there, and we talk about it, and other people speak about it, is despite of the fact that we know that it's a da their danger for them coming, they could still come and be very effective and sweep full whole populations behind them. Josephus Plavius speaks about that even before the destruction of the temple, even before that, there are many, they speak about many false messiah that promised to save Israel. Um, there are those who kind of disturb the peace of the city, like the zealous, you know, and the secret king, and they they deceive the people and walked with them to the desert to show them wonders. They were trying to imitate the wonders that were made, and um, and they show them. And this is a very very important cue to watch for. And this is so-called the signs of salvation. Remember it, signs of salvation. What one were to, we were to expect to indicate the coming of the Messiah that will bring in salvation. And that we're all waiting for salvation. Nowadays, more than in any other time, and you know, Israel feels it every day. And the whole world, the, the so-called the normal, the the 
the good part of the world, of the population of the world, is expecting it. Something needs to be done, that needs to be happening. So we are very prone not right now to be deceived as well as to get the gift of coming of a Messiah to bring and complete the work of restoring the faith and the kingdom of God. What is called throughout the New Testament, Malchut HaShamayim, the kingdom of heaven is already here, says there Jesus, Yeshua, in the New Testament. This is the kingdom of heaven. So people are waiting for that. And this is what luring and attracting fake um, performers to get into this. Now, this is written in the book, in the chapter called The Wars, uh, 54, 52, and then in uh, the other one, okay, there are verses where to get it. In the year 44 AD, there was a false messiah by the name Todus, Theodos, and it's mentioned in the New Testament, right? He gathered the people to the Jordan River, look where, to the Jordan River, he too, you know, and he said that he's gonna split the water and people of Israel, and the people will move in or go through in the dry land. Now that happened twice, right? In the Jordan River once, and it happened also in the Sea of Reeds when Israel came out. So this is like a sign of coming salvation. So a Roman officer by the name of uh, Cospius Pados sent the um, uh, troops after them, killed many of them, and also beheaded Todos. And it's mentioned in Josephus Plavius, but I'll show you where it's coming in the New Testament itself. So in um, Matthew 23, 23, there is the warning, and this warning is valid today as well as at that time. And the warning says this, then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ, or there believe it not. Here is Cli here or there is Christ, believe it not. And then continues in, in verse 24. For this shall arise false Christs, Meshicheshekir, false messiahs, and false prophets. Not only false Christ, there are also false prophets. And shall uh, sue, sue uh, great signs of, or, or, and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Meaning even the, le so they're not only ordinary laymen people like most of us are, you know, but they're also going to deceive leaders, heads of communities, people that believe them. In nowadays, it means pastors, community leaders, um, even higher ranks than that may fall to that deceit. Now, think of that today, how viable and how possible it will be. Today, with the AI technology and other manipulations of sound and picture, image, and videography, picture that it's possible to take a person that is known to be dead, bring images of these people speaking, and even holding, let's say, a newspaper. You know what they do that in, in terms of hostages, just to show or to show validity of time. Somebody holds a newspaper and you know it's a valid newspaper with a date on it. They can do that and re-erect an image of a person who died holding a paper and even saying it in his own voice. And you know, they imitate voices and so on. That will be a very powerful deceit that probably is going to be coupled with the coming Antichrist, the false messiah that is yet to come, and they will come. Granted, there are many, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some that devastated the Jewish people, and there is an intersection here between Jews and Christians. The term messiah is an Hebraic word. It's coming from Hebrew. Talking about words, where is the lady that spoke to me about the people that she met yesterday on Friday, from, from India? Are you here? Are you there? Would you come here for a second? Hey, here you are. <laughs> you know, we talked about the 10 tribes of Israel going there to the area where India was. And <laughs> this lady, what's your name? I forgot. Sharon. Oh, Sharon. And Sharon approached me <laughs> and she said, you know, this. why don't you say it? <laughs> so last night I was at a Shabbat meal 
at Terry Mount's house. Some of you might remember her. And her neighbors are from India. And we were explaining to her about Shabbat. And it was totally new to her. And But the word she said in Hindu, or a dialect of Hindu, she was from Punjab, um, meant um, a religious song or a religious prayer. And then we got the hala out and she said, oh, when we celebrate our religion, we have a sweet bread as well. It's not called hala, but a sweet bread. So many um, intersections that he was talking about. It was like, and this just happened last night. So it was very exciting coincidence. God, you know. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Sharon. Yeah, so just in that area, there, just an example of customs. And you know what? Talk to other people. Things will come up. I don't know all of them. But this is just haphazard, just here. She was this Shabbat, and she heard that Shabbat. And then, the, you know, the word priesthood, kehuna, that's priesthood in Hebrew. What's the name of the high rank there in Hawaii? The, the great kahuna, right? What is kahuna if not kehuna? Priesthood, the high priest, and so on. Okay, so um, it's very viable. It's very possible. And they know, they all knew, even at that time, where, where there was more difficult at that time to show and to perform miracles, if you are not a miracle maker, indeed, by the name and the power of God to, to perform miracles. Today is bound to be, and it's going, going to be much easier to mimic and to pretend and to show so-called miracles to our layman eyes. And this is the danger. So we're not afraid of somebody going, oh, I'm a Messiah. Well, we, are, we have barriers to know these, not, but we may be deceived by miracles, actual or so-called technological, very advanced technological effects that will look to us as though, as though they are really indeed miracles and they indicate <clears throat> the coming of that Messiah. So um, also in Acts, look at Acts 5, 36, 37. You don't have it in your papers, but... It says, here is a todos. This todos is mentioned there. Because before these days came a man by the name Todos, who raised himself up to say, I am the man. I am the one. And uh, 400 people gathered around him until he was killed. And all those who accompanied him were be scattered to all sides. And, and then there's another one. During that time, you know, Jesus was Galilean. Yeshua was from Galilee, right? So look at that in, uh, in uh, Acts 5, 36, and, and then 37. It says this. After that man rose up Judas the Galilee. There's a man, Yehuda the Galilean, the Galilee, the Galilean, in the days of the taxing. You know, he came in the days of the taxing. And he also drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as uh, obeyed him, were dispersed. Okay, so he, they managed to carry, to kind of gather around them followers. And I'll just mention a few more. There are many, but some of them are important, important in terms of the effect that they had on the population. And um, there was a man, a Syrian man. Syria was part of the, of the Jewish or the, you know, they used to go, like Paul went to Damascus, remember? In, on his way to Damascus, and it was part of the um, Jewish world at the time. A Syrian man by the name Sarigi or Sirini, they don't know exactly, Sirinus, is mentioned also in the, um, in the letters of the sages uh, called Sha'arei Tzedek, the gates of righteousness, and the name was Sharia. You know, Sharia, today we know the word Sharia, it's the Halacha is the religious part of Islam, you know. So he was, this was at the time of the second caliph, Omar, Omar II, in the, in the year uh, 717 to 720. Uh, the caliph, this caliph really caused much trouble to Israel and forced them to accept the faith of Muhammad. This is only a hundred and some, 120 years after Muhammad, Muhammad. And um, the Jews were expecting the Messiah to save them. Um, Sirini uh, was asking them, well, the Jews, and I'll show you the intersection between Jews and Christians. It became really one in terms of both waiting for the Messiah, and it went. some of those went up to the Pope himself, 
which is the Christian at the time. So Sirini uh, commanded them to uh, drop and to kind of uh, shake away all the yoke of the kingdom over them, and also the yoke of the Torah, the Talmudic Torah. The, the Torah. Talmud is basically the commentary of the Torah to daily life at the time, and even today they are following it. I mean, people follow the Talmud, which is commentary of the Bible. Many times the Bible is difficult to understand. What do they mean? How do you basically relate the ordinance, or not rules, the law that some of it has been canceled? Pastor Mark has, will have a very interesting teaching about that, something we just discovered lately. I mean, he knows very well, but we discovered it from a different perspective, which is amazing. We really dealt with the Greek, and it, it's going to be in the Mark Bill's Bible. Amazing teaching um, about how do you divide the Torah, and I was supposed to talk about it today. So we'll, you know what? I'll take a little break here and I'll do that, you know? So look, um, we talk, the reason we read Galatians and we worked, the last thing that we did with Pastor Mark, we worked on Galatians and we worked with, um, what? I can't read that. It's light in my face. Ah, yeah, yeah, I know. I don't have, to, well, we see. I, I really don't have the time to do everything, but let me talk about that. Very important, Pastor Mark is going to do that, the in-depth teaching soon. Probably next week or the week after, I need to text him the subject. Um, we did uh, working on Galatians and on Second Corinthians, First and Second Corinthians. And we find some references there speaking about the curse of the Torah. The curses of the Torah, you will see that. Um, and I was very appalled by the statement, curses, what curses? And there is a verse in, in uh, Numbers, you know, speaking about curses. But then it all comes and we notice something very amazing. And this is something that relates to each one of you. You know the idea that you're saved by faith and not by works, right? Works is doing the deed, the da, da, da. And faith is, you're saved by the faith. Okay. Now, what is that issue with the law? Why is it so terrible, the law? You know, every time you hear that, there is an undertone of scorning. Ah, oh, the law. You hear that it's something horrible. Oh, shy away from the law. Well, part of the law said you should respect your father and your mother. Part of the law says you should not kill, murder, so, and, you know, and you should not cheat, and so, and you should not steal, and you should not murder. So, are we done with the law? I mean, this is it. Now, now, let's go take a knife and, whoa, happily go and murder people in the street or in the restaurant. Where, what's going on here? I mean, what, what, it's in a kind of an exclusion. Like, everything is included. Is the entire enchilada of the law, the Torah, is now going to be thrown away? No, but what part is and what part isn't something that we should follow? Why do we do such an inclusive thing to say we're done with the law, with his life, and the law is over, and this is it? This is very shallow theology to claim that the whole Torah is gone. It's very, very shallow, and it's very much a replacement theology. Do not accept it. I mean, the whole essence of this congregation, of his teaching, of Pastor Mark's teaching, is bringing the Torah to the nations. Is it the entire Torah? No. There is part of the law, law, that is not valid today, which is correct to say that there are no sacrifices nowadays. They have been canceled. According to Jewish people, when the temple was destroyed, there was no more need for sacrifice at the time. It may be restored and so on. Pastor Mark teaches on that. This is too theological for me to get into that you can talk to him. And to Christians, it was, to believers, it was when Jesus came and he took away. And it is in Isaiah, you know, God says that I will in, in, inflict the, um, how to, uh, the sins of the people in that man, right? In his son. Okay. So that part, and this is a very large part of the law. I mean, there are details of how to sacrifice and what to cut and what this and what that, what pieces of the, of the um, calf. Long, long stories and how to do that and who is allowed to do that. That's part of the law. 
and that's part of the law is done with, but it's not the entire, the entire law or the Torah, in other words, the Torah, that is done with. But if you look more closely to the Torah, to the rules and the laws and the ordinances of the Torah, you'll find a clear distinction between two kinds of laws. One is called the law between a person to person, and it's called Bain Adam Lechavero. You can write it down, Bain Adam Lechavero, the laws between a person to person. The other set of laws in the Torah is kind of sharply divided, called the laws between a person to the place. When we say place, it's a euphemism to say God. So this is laws between a person to the Lord, okay? Two distinctions, a person to person, a person to the Lord. What is included in the laws between a person to God? This is mainly the ritualistic things. Um, how to do the sukkah and uh, you know, keeping the unleavened bread and keeping the Sabbath, for instance, the kosher, you know, the di dietary laws, all those are not a person-to-person -person thing, right? Shab Sabbath, you keep yourself. And, the, and, and so on, in, in Sukkot, in the, in the holiday of the Feast of Tabernacle, you shake the reeds four times to the right, four times to the left, and so on. Many things that are parts of the rituals of the ancient time, of the time. And people do that today too, Jewish people, right? Not all, but they do. So these are laws between a person to person, laws between a person to the place, instead of saying the word God in vain, you know? Okay, now what, where is the problem? And Jesus, Yeshua, in the New Testament, attended to that. This is how we got into that with Pastor Mark in, in our research. One very simple, this is Matthew. Um, okay, so the orthodoxy at the ancient time, they had to describe those two, the distinguish between the two, the two laws, person to person, person to God. They called, the laws between a person to person, mitzvot kalot, light laws. Light, like no, well, in a way, what's light? No big deal, right? And the la laws between a person to God or to the place, they call them mitzvot chamurot, severe laws. By the meaning, you can hear severe is severe, meaning punishment is much. Well, there is a problem in that distinction, and it's still be called the same way today. Um, in one verse there in uh, Matthew, people come to him and say, well, what, what, how do we treat the law? What do we do? Jesus, Yeshua. And he equates them. He said, we're basically upgrading the laws between a person to person. He says they are equally important, you know, and they are considered to be less and they equalize them, to so bring them up. That's something they could not hear at the time. This is like breaking the, the whole concept of what's important what's light and what's severe. But he did that. Okay, so it's, this is not light. I mean, what is more difficult to do the rituals that are required there in the Torah, you know, uh, Sabbath and this, and, and, and the, uh, a lot of things, you know, but they are part of rituals or actions that you do with yourself, right? Or to be a real good person, not to steal, not to lie, not to cheat, not that. You know, I mean, you, can, you can name atrocities. The entire US, U.S. Constitution includes <laughs> a whole list of what is not allowed to do, and those are mostly laws between a person to person. And so is the common law of England. They don't speak about sacrificing and all that. that the common law in, in England that affected also the law in Israel, so-called the common law, uh, and this is like mostly person-to-person -person laws. And this is how people live by, and that's how you get penalized by the laws of between person-to-person. -person. Today, also between person-to-state. You know, like you're driving high, too high speed in the, on the freeway, you don't do anything wrong to another person. You may, because of the speed, can hurt someone, but it's still the person to the state, okay? But they are kind of limited to way that serves community and society. Okay, 
So um, with that distinction of the loss between, uh, that now they, when we read, read the chapter that they mentioned in the New Testament about the curses of the Torah, I was very appalled, I was very moved, and I didn't, I was very upset. And I looked back, and Pastor Mark said, well, here is it coming from. I did not even know. Old Testament, and all the laws there, they says, curses is the one who doesn't respect his father and mother. Curses is the one who killed. Wow. All those curses, they call the curses of the Torah, are curses of those who violate the laws between a person to person. Except for one exception there, there's the one who creates or makes a statue, you know, like a statue, like a pestle, um, is cursed. And why? Because the, the verse continues and says, the one who makes a statue and hides it, and hides it in his home, he is cursed too. So now it stopped being between a person to the place, or oh God. It becomes, when you do that and hide it, God may punish your household and then you're causing trouble to other people in your place. And this is why that belongs also to the laws between a person to person. Interesting. But with no exception, we saw that. Pastor Mark did a recording on that one. You'll hear it in, in the Mark Witt's Bible. Pretty amazing. Most Christians have no clue, not even a, how do you say that? A hoot of knowledge about this subject or not a green idea or what do you say? They have no clue about this. is a very important thing to understand. And without that, nobody can really understand truly the New Testament. I'm telling you, you cannot understand the New Testament and the ideas of the teaching of Yeshua without knowing this. And knowing this will be detailed by Pastor Mark. This is like a theological issue, very important, but it's beyond my level, so he can do that. And you'll teach that here soon. And it's in the Bible. It's in the Mark Bill's Bible. So just like you saw here on page one, there's a little speaker there touched by the name of the verse. You click on it and you can hear his commentary built into the Bible. And it's large characters. It's big. And it's, it's all over. This is one aspect of this Bible. I know it's great. I know. Um, it's one aspect that when you click, you see a verse. Wow. And if it's an important one, he has this commentary, and it's not like three hours sitting, and, oh, like you sometimes on the web, you go and there, oof, you fall asleep in the last 30 seconds. No, here's exciting and short, one to two and three minutes max on a subject. So it's really attainable. You click, you can hear, you go, and then thousands of corrections that are uh, written in green. Like, you know, the text is not in black anymore, the English, but it will be green that Pastor Mark changed it after much research to something that is more correct and true. And you'll see that it's all over. And some names like this and so on. Okay, let's go back to the um, more of the false messiah. One of the famous messiahs, and th this is starting with Jews, but it really kind of intersects with Islam and Christianity. One of the first false messiahs, his name is David Al-Roy. al Roy. He was born in the city of Ahmadiyya in Kurdistan, in Iraq, around 1160. 1160, okay? And he made a call for all the Jews in Asia that he is a, a, a representative from God to bring his people under, again, under the suffering of the rulers and to relive the Israeli um, nationality and bring them back to the land of Israel. This is mainly the purpose of every Messiah, bring them back to the land, right? Um, he gathered to him many people from Mosul, Mosul in, in Baghdad, and he, he armed them under their, web, under their clothing, they put arms, and they fight with the Persian ruler, and they were killed. And also David al Roy was killed too. His believers said that he, he was, guess what? Guess what? What did the believer would say about him? Of course, that he was resurrected, and he came before the Shah, the leader of Persia, and he was invisible. He could see and could not be seen. You know legends of the old time? A lot of those, right? His uh, followers called him the comforter, or the, not the comfort, the, the, the one who counsels, you know, they conf give comfort, right? 
and they and they created of a, a, a sect, you know, that called the Menachamim, those who give comfort. Um, the Jews in Baghdad were punished, and they had to pay a lot of money because of that revolt. Another one famous is called, his name is David Hareuveni, David from the tribe of Reuben. He presented himself as the, the brother of the king, Kaibar, in the land also in Arab, and he sent, and he was sent to the Pope and to the kings of Europe and asked them to fight the Ishmaelites. Look at that. First time we're talking about the war of Christianity and Judaism against, who is the Ishmaelites? The Muslims at the time, right? And he said that he is from the descendant of Reuben, and they will live there under Bnei Mate Gad and Mena, the tribe of Gad and Menasseh, and his intention is to unite them and the rest of the Jews, and they're talking about Jews at that time, right? That is beyond the Sea of Reeds, and to revolt the Ishmaelites. The Pope, uh, Clemon VII, received him with great honor in the year 1524, and a year after, he was accepted before the King of Portugal. They thought in the beginning, the beginning that Reubini will be a minister for them against Turgama, which is a you know, Muslim area. Um, and eventually, um, the, the cardinal by the name of Celia, that he was afraid that this thing will hurt the Christian faith in his country. And because, um, because of Reubini, what, what was the problem? The problem was that because of Reubini coming now, the Jewish Messiah, and he is now accepted by the Pope to represent him, they were afraid that the convertos, conversos, you know, you know who are the conversos, right? You don't? Um, in the year 1492, yeah, 1492, the king and queen of Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella, he gave a deadline, and that was the Tisha Be'av, the ninth of Av on that year to be the last day of Jews to live in Spain, later on in Portugal, as Jews. And if they wanted to stay there, they had to convert to Christianity, Catholicism at the time. And if, if not, they'll be persecuted by the Inquisition. The Inquisition is the group that was nominated by the church to persecute heretics. Not Jews, heretics. They're not... Uh, contrary to the belief that they are really f chasing Jews, they're not. They were chasing heretics of the church, you know. Jews were given the option either to convert or leave the country. Of course, they could not leave with property or with money. They let them go out very impoverished without anything. So many did. And the people, for instance, today, Jews in Holland or in Eastern Europe, in my part of Eastern Europe, they are all Spanish Jews and in Romania, and also in Hungary, in this part of Eastern Europe, and Western Europe too, they are Sephardic. And the Jews in England, the early ones, also came from Spain after the decree. But those who stayed there had to do the conversion to Christianity, to Catholicism. Well, many did that in order not to leave. It's very difficult in certain parts of life to leave your property, your house, and all that, and just get out with nothing, you know. So they said, well, they went and converted, but not wholeheartedly. The Inquisition noticed that, that they, they are really kind of not truly Christians, you know, and they don't do, and they keep on eating kosher and so on. They sent spies. They looked them through the window, and they saw that they were lighting candles on Friday night, and uh, they tried to trap them in restaurants, in places of public places of eateries, and they saw that they were avoiding pigs, you know, uh, ham, and so on. I call it pigs. Um, they <laughs> they avoiding that, and they persecuted them. That was what the Inquisition did. So now, with this David Reuveni, that Hashman, that cardinal, was afraid that now, with there is such a revival of the Jewish uh, Messiah and going back to the land, they were afraid that the conversos, what they called them also Moranos, means pigs in Spanish, right? And they were afraid that they, these conversos 
will go back and return to the faith of their fathers. They will drop Christianity and go back to Judaism. Among them, there was the converso by the name Dionophiris that was that he, he already left Christianity. He, he turned Jewish again, and his name was Shlomo Molcho, a very famous name too, that later on he was burned in the Otto da Fe. That was the stakes, the stake that the, the Inquisition burned people in public. They burned him later on. But he also met, you know, he started prophesizing. I read some of his prophecy in Hebrew. Amazing Hebrew. Amazing. You know, the language. And he, he kind of adapted something. He was a serious false, false messiah. Very dangerous one. And spoke eloquently and amazing, you know. And because of that, he was, he was, uh, he was judged to death by the Pope. They put him on the stake. And they about to start the burning. And the Pope, Pius II, I think, uh, asylumed him. And they took him out of the stake, and he promised and signed that he's not going to call himself Messiah again, and he's pardoned. And guess what? Just a few days after, he started doing it again. And eventually, because he thought, well, I'm here in the mission of God, you know. Then he was caught in Spain, and he well, actually they did not put him on the stake. I was wrong. First time they did, but they didn't kill him this way. But he was caught in Spain, and he was uh, killed in the prison with a poison uh, liquid, some poison thing. Now, the most dangerous, the most dangerous one of all was Shabtai Tzvi. The name Shabtai Tzvi, he established a whole movement called the Sabbatianism, the Sabbatianism, and their residuals exist until today in part of Turkey, in Anatolia, called, and they are called the Dunma. They're called the Dunma. And look what he did. He was the most devastating and the most dangerous one of all. It's still not modern time, you know. He was born in Izmir, Turkey, in the year 1626. Yeah. And um, he went to Kushta, and he met with the great wazir, which is the, the sultan at the time. This is that we're talking about the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Empire was as big, not as big as the Roman Empire, but they were pretty much big. You know, you understand Turkey at the time was the cradle of Christianity, right? It was the cradle of Christianity. After it, it was the whatever happened is the Roman Empire was divided to two: the Western Roman Empire that was main mainly um, positioned in Rome. And it affected large parts of Western Europe, all the way to Norway and to Sweden and to England. All, all these areas Rome, under the Roman Empire. And then there was the Eastern Roman Empire, extending from the Bosphorus to the east, all the way to even to Asia. You know, that was the Eastern Roman Empire. Of course, Israel was under their rule and regime for 400 years of the Turkish, you know. And um, so they extended a large area, and the Roman, the Eastern Roman Empire eventually subsided and turned to be the first Christian kingdom. And that was in Turkey. It all started in Istanbul today, Constantinopolis. At the time, they were Christians, and some time before, they became a Christian kingdom. And the beginning of Christianity, the Catholic Church there, it was called Kushta in the uh, Turkish, in Arabic. So he was born in another city in Izmir, and he went to Kushta. But now, um, before we talk about him more, because this is a, he was a very dangerous one, and I'll put you into some kind of theology and show you why he was so favored by so many Jews and deceived them. So today we're thinking the deceit will come by means of technology, right? Miracles by technology. At that time, the miracles were shown by something else. But after him, and I'm skipping a little bit, and I'll go back to him, there was Yaakov Tzvi ben Shabtai Tzvi. Yaakov Tzvi was the son of Shabtai Tzvi after he, was the, he died. And he was the head of the Dunme sect, and he replaced the place of his father as the Messiah. The father did not work as a Messiah, but the son continued. And he had hundreds of believers, all of them converted to Islam in the year 1687. And he himself went to Mecca 
in Saudi Arabia, where every Muslim needs to go there at least once in his life, you know, Hijra, Hijra. And that was in the year 1690. And when he came back, he was sick and died in Alexandria. Alexandria at the time also later on became a top place for Christianity, right? A very, all the right, many writers of Christian writings that laid the foundation for the Catholic Church later on uh, to the Protestant, but not, not to lesser degree, was in Alexandria, Egypt. So after him, also his son Berechia or Birukia in the year 1740, also was considered a Messiah. Look at that. I mean, it doesn't, relentless, you know, and he was from the caste called Miguel Abraham in, in, uh, in Spanish, Cardozo, that had, they said that he is the son of Messiah, son of Joseph. Sounds familiar? Well, there is two aspects here, the Messiah, son of Joseph, and the Messiah, son of David, Mashiach ben Yosef, Mashiach ben David, right? How do you see, for instance, Jesus? Is that from the side of David or the side of Yosef? Different explanations, right? But that's for the pastor. It's theology of different kind. So, um, and there was another one, but, I, you know, I can really go over, but let's go, because the time, yeah, I don't have much time. So, let me tell you what this Shabtai Tzvi actually did and why he was so powerful. To do that, I'll have to do this first. In August 1660, a man, this is after many pogroms. Are you familiar with the word pogrom? Those are persecution that led to killing, torturing, and eliminating Jewish life in Europe. And they were, this is anti-Semitic uh, persecution of Jews in Europe, throughout Europe. It was in Russia. It was in, even in, I don't know in France to say for sure, but it was in March parts of Eastern Europe and in Western Europe as well. Anti-Semitism was great, big in France too, but it was all over. Anti-Semitic, during that time, Jews cannot get education. They allowed, the liberal ones of them, allowed one Jew for every nine non-Jewish students. So guess what? A university of like, you know, hundreds of people barely had one or two. So they couldn't get education. And, uh, <clears throat> That was the light, and the serious one was killing. Killing in large numbers in cities, in places, in the, on the roads, everywhere. But Jews were devastated. They were really devastated. They prayed for the salvation every day and every night. They were really lived in poverty and in pain and in danger. And that was a very, very um, green meadow for appearance of a Messiah that can promise salvation. And here comes the man. He, he swept Christians too, believe it or not. And uh, I'll explain to you something that you probably heard. You probably heard the undertone of Kabbalah, right? And you know, I don't know where you got it, but you got the notion that it's something very bad, right? You did? You, yeah? Is that something that you should shy away from? Well, tell you what. There is nothing really bad in Kabbalah. Nothing. You know, it's nothing. It's, <laughs> I believe that there's nothing good in that either, but there is nothing bad. The intention of Kabbalah is to make God greater. That's the intention, to make God greater. But the misuse of Kabbalah is where the problem is, or the use. You know, using it is where the problem is, okay? And people believe in that wholeheartedly, that the truth and the knowledge, this is mysticism indeed, but they believe that the truth is there, and this is what to know, to know that, will lead people to salvation. The intention of the heart of the Kabbalists was very good. There was nothing wrong. They really tried to make great God, you know, to, to in, admire God and make him greater and, and more than anything else and exalted. Not good, bad intention. The misuse was the problem, the use. So what happened that with this Kabbalah and how does it relate? It, on one hand, you have people that are very oppressed and distressed. On the other hand, they're, on the same hand, they're waiting for the salvation to get out and, and put an end to the agony and suffering at which they are, in which they are 
so deeply immersed. And then in that kind of fruitful soil of spiritual acceptance comes the man in the year 1660 in Podolia, Poland, which is one of the greatest Jewish schools of the time, yeshiva, but high exalted yeshiva. This is like a, where people are really, all this, a lot of sages came from there, from Podolia, Poland, from that place. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, more or less in the same words, let me introduce myself. I am the King Messiah that came with the salvation of Israel. And people are, wow, there is nothing else that we're waiting more. But, you know, I mean, no dummies. They said to him, can we see some kind of a positive ID? <laughs> can we see? I said, sure. And he brings them a letter written by the greatest Kabbalist of the time, the man that does Kabbalah. And that was Rabbi Nathan from Gaza. Believe it or not, same Gaza that we're fighting today was a center of Kabbalah at the time, a Jewish center of Kabbalah. It's not coincidence that people want to go back and resettle, you know, there are Jews that want to resettle Gaza. It was a great center of Jewish studies. So that prophet, Rabbi Israel, he has a long name, like six names, but he was called Rabbi Nathan from Gaza. He's from Jerusalem originally, went to Gaza and created the Kabbalah, and he comes with the letter, and the letter says that he is the Messiah. Now, that great rabbi at the time heard about Shabtai Tzvi. He was also acting in Israel, in Jerusalem, in other places, wanted to meet him. Before that, Shabtai Tzvi said he's Messiah, but did not take any action of any kind. But Rabbi Nathan from Gaza told him, you are the Messiah. I saw it, I was expecting you, and I know that you are the one that will bring salvation to Israel. So, wow, okay. What do you want me to do? Go, move, start bringing the salvation. So he sends him to Europe, and here comes the theological deceit. In the book of Zohar, this is one of the two books of Kabbalah, right? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and there is another Kabbalah called the Lurian Kabbalah of the Holy Ari from Tzfat, from the city of Tzfat. He brings the book of Zohar, and he starts working the principle of acrosticons. You counting every 50th letter character and in certain area in the book of Kabbalah and came up to the words, Shabtai Tzvi, King Messiah. Wow, when they saw that, counting 50 words in the book of Kabbalah, they said, this is it. This is the proof because they held Kabbalah as something very important and it's the key to truth. When they, when they saw that, they rallied behind him in an unbelievable passion. And then there was something else in Kabbalah, I'll tell you in a few seconds. Um, but this is what the proof, it's written in the book, people rallied behind him. Now think, who are those people that go to yeshivas and high yeshivas? Those are not elderly people, they're young, right? They're young people, they're starting with early yeshiva, then they go to higher yeshiva, then they become sages, you know, Sofrim and others and leaders and, and, and commentator of the Torah. They're very, very wise people, right? And they follow him because they saw him the Kabbalah. And uh, he is very propelled and he feels that, well, I need to do some action here because now I have the title. This We're talking about the first serious Antichrist, you know. The f Christ is Messiah, right? The first serious Christian got interest in him as well. And wow, like, like miracle, they knew about Kabbalah. They were not afraid of it yet at that time. They were not. They saw it as something very deep, but here is where the fear came that you heard it and you heard, whoa, shy away from that, I'll tell you where it's coming from. So he's very propelled. He knows that he needs to do what Messiah does. First step, to release the people and get them back to their homeland, the land of Israel. So you go to the ruler, and the ruler is the Sultan. I think the first one was Abed al-Rahman, or I don't remember, um, I forgot his name. He forgives me now. He goes to the Sultan, and he tells him something, and the Sultan is in Kushta, Constantinople, you know, later. And he tells him nothing less than in the world, what? 10 more minutes, right? Five more? Oh, seven, yeah. Okay, so, and he tells him, and he tells him 
let my people go. And the Sultan, we don't know, I mean, there's no very few recordings from that time, 16, 17. And he said to him something along those lines, listen, buddy, I loved your presentation, but here are your two option, options. One, you're converting right now to Islam. Option number two, you see this beautiful tree outside my castle here in Kushta? I'm going to hang you before sunset. So make your choice. So what do you think the Jewish Messiah, the first Antichrist, is deciding? Yes, you're right. He decides to convert to Islam. So now, converting to today, you convert to Christianity, you don't need to wear big crosses like they did at the time of the Inquisition. Converting to Judaism, you don't, nobody sees on you. Converting to Islam, you have to, at that time, wear this gown. And it's very detectable. A, a true Muslim, you can see a true Muslim, a believer, because they bow down to Mecca, to the east, from here, five times a day. They have to do that. It's part of the Islamic, the Muslim faith, you know? So it comes out, hundreds of thousands of Jews from all over Europe are with him to get the permission to go back to the Holy Land. Let my people go, just like Moses. And here comes out their Messiah as a Muslim. Comes out the Muslim, falls on his, his knees, and prays to, the, prays to Muhammad and aiming to Mecca. How do you explain it? I mean, this is going to be, no. Here is how you use the holy called, so called Kabbalah. Well, to tell you that, there, Kabbalah is very detailed stuff, but there are two main principles in Kabbalah, main, two main principles. One is called the theory of the, uh, of the spark. And this is in the, in the um, I think in Shimon Bar Yochai, and also in the Ari. Okay, the spark, according to which theology, God was an entity of light, that one shone and gave light to the whole world. At some point in history, it had to spread itself all over the world, and that entity of light spread to small, tiny sparks that are covering the earth, and they are just buried, not deep enough, but just buried below the surface. And this is called, and so they are everywhere. The sparks are everywhere, but a man, a person needs to dig in the mud, in the dirt, to bring up the sparks. And you understand the metaphor here, right? You have to work hard to bring it good. You have to do much effort to bring righteousness and so on. So the entity of light and justice is just below the ground. One needs to dig to bring in the sparks. So the first principle of Kabbalah is called the nitzots. It's called the spark. The second important principle of Kabbalah is called the departure of the righteous men, Yeridat HaTzadik. So the departure of the righteous men is the action of digging in the mud, in the dirt, and bringing up the sparks that are God, and, and, they, and they talk about, and they bring about the justice and, and all the good things. Okay, so explaining that by the name of Kabbalah, so, you know, three things a Jew cannot do. And one of them is converting out of Judaism to another faith. This is like extermination if a person does that. But he explains it, and this is that what I do, meaning converting to Islam is really forbidden, but it's good in Kabbalah because you're digging in the mud, in the dirt, and then you, you know, but the purpose is to bring back good. So he explains it as something very positive that he did, and everybody should do. And here you got hundreds of thousands of Jews converting to Islam right there and do that. But he's not stopping there. He said, what do you mean you cannot eat pigs? Well, digging in the mud, bringing the good, we can do anything that is wrong in the Torah, in the law. So let's do that. They ate pigs and they did all kind of horrific stuff, as horrific as you can imagine and more, including, I don't know if I should say that, but, you know, bad stuff. You know, kind of what I mean, with including with animals, you know. So this is the whole group of of Dunme right there in Turkey. This is a very devastating time. By the time they understood that the situation is so horrific, there was no more Jews willing to go and send their kids to any school because they thought, well, they used them, those schools, to teach Kabbalah, and that Kabbalah deceived their brains and their minds and they are not allowed to go, and they kept them at home. 
Now, there's no TV at the time, there's no recordings, there's no teaching. How do you get, continue the Jewish education? How do you keep the faith, basically? There's no way at the time to keep the faith unless you send your child to those schools, you know? No education, school, they're not, they're not allowed in schools, remember? So to keep Judaism, they had to go, but they couldn't. And then came a man by the name Habaal Shemtov, the owner of the good name, and he said, hold on, what's your problem, Jude? And they said, no, 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 my child will never go to those yeshivas anymore, to those places, because they swept their mind, and we lost most of, it is really 60 to 70% of Jews in Europe converted to Islam. They lost, and they lost faith completely. So this Baal Shem Tov said, no, 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 hold on. What, you believe that God is everywhere, right? Forget Kabbalah, no Kabbalah, he's everywhere, yeah. Well, you don't need to go to the synagogue. Let's do it in your home, in your backyard. Let's pray here. And he brought back the joy and happiness to the hearts of people. He said, well, we could, yes. So I'll teach your children. He went from place to place who was teaching their children. And then he, he brought some other people that went from place to place to their homes and said, let's celebrate here because they're very gloomy and they're sad of the disaster. He said, no, bring back happiness. This is what you call Hasidism. This is the man who started the movement of Hasidism. Time is 11.29. I'll have to end here. Thank you very much for coming. I did not cover everything, but I think we've covered a very important chunk of that story. Shalom.